Ah yes, driving through the countryside. Windows down, music, nice and loud, just another road trip. You see a bunch of cows out the window. One of them really stands out, literally. The other cows look like black and white hamsters. The Guinness World Record for tallest cow ever goes to this cow named Blossom. This big grass guzzler was six foot four. <laughs> Somebody better buy that cow some basketball shoes. The average cow's only four foot five. Blossom must have felt like a giant. When you're that tall, you don't just hang around in a field eating grass. Blossom was the official greeter for a local resort. Big Jake. And believe me, big is an understatement. This guy got famous for being the world's tallest horse. Checking in at a whopping 6 foot 11, we're gonna need a whole lot of basketball shoes. What a stud, which actually pretty much just means male horse, so... Now what about this little cutie, the world's shortest female horse? Her name is Thumbelina. What a perfect name. And she's only about 1 foot 5. That didn't stop her from going viral though. Oh, and the shortest male horse is called Bomble. It means bubble in Polish. He's only two feet tall, but his heart is larger than life. So, so cute and shorter than a greyhound. Now, I'm a full-out dog person. Well, regular-sized dog person. Zeus, a Great Dane, was officially the world's tallest dog. Being three foot eight on all fours made you think you were looking at a small horse. Imagine that face waking you up in the morning. And what about taking him out for a walk? you'd have needed a pretty strong leash. According to his owners, he was a gentle giant and was usually laid back, luckily. And Zeus had a really important job. He was a certified therapy dog, spreading his love and joy to all in need. Imagine a dog like that. You wouldn't need to put out a water bowl every day. He could just drink straight out of the tap. Hugging would be on a whole different level, too. How much do you think that guy ate? Would he have even fit on your bed? So many questions. Now what if you're a cat person? You'd better prepare yourself. Ha! Get it? Anyway, this cool cat over here has been called the world's longest domesticated cat. His name's Baravel, which means clown, and he comes from a small town in Italy. He's a gentle giant too, which is good because he's longer than a baseball bat. When they see a photo, people usually think he's been photoshopped. He enjoys basking in the sun by the window, staring out into the backyard. Hunting mice must feel like chasing ants to him. The previous title holders were called Ludo and Stewie, the same breed as Baravel. That's a lot of cat fur on my mom's new sofa. Sheesh. Hopping up next is a rabbit named Darius. His long ears and cute button nose aren't why he's special. A regular rabbit's about 14 inches, but Darius here? Just over 50. That's basically a rabbit dog. Darius grew up on a farm in England, and living out in an open field gave him a super chill personality. Feeding him must be tough, though. Darius must be a carrot-eating machine. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Enough of the cute stuff. Time for some more exotic animals. Maybe even mythical ones. Myths are just how people explain crazy things. Like the legend of the white-lipped man. That turned out to be just me eating cheesecake. Quick and shifty under the water, able to bring down an entire ship, the Kraken was famous for disappearing ships. That's what the legends say. Probably just a sailor's tale told to scare the new recruits. But researchers may have found its baby brother. The largest ever recorded squid was almost 60 feet long, but the researchers forgot to video it. Huh, no! The largest squid ever caught on camera was about 25 feet. That's like an RV. Scientists think there might be larger ones out there, but they're kind of camera shy. The great white shark, frightening ocean animals left and right. She's called the queen of the ocean. She's not one of those kind and gentle queens, oh no. Scientists were able to tag her to study her more. This queen weighs about 3,500 pounds. That's like six motorbikes or 14,000 hot dogs. She was caught in the waters off Nova Scotia by a team of terrified researchers. 
good thing sharks only chill in the ocean. Unless... What about an episode of Shark Ninja Warriors? That was the biggest. Now, the longest. Good guess, but nope. Definitely not a snake. But it is as long as half a football field. This animal was discovered in the deep waters off Australia. They found it there, glowing. And get this, scientists say it isn't even a single creature. It just acts like one. It's actually a whole colony, cloning and multiplying until it gets... even bigger? Its technical name... Um... This next animal can move on land and water. Don't be fooled by its short scrawny legs. A crocodile can run as fast as a human on land. So if you're running a lap against these sprinters, try to climb up a tree as high as you can. Crocs can't climb trees, but you'd better believe they'll be waiting for you when you get down. They're also the heaviest reptiles in the world. An adult can weigh about the same as two small cars. The largest one in captivity was a saltwater croc in the Philippines. Lolong was his name, and he was 20 feet long. That's like two ping pong tables end to end with a whole bunch of teeth. Slithering up next, another reptile, a beast of a serpent from Malaysia. Some workers were on break at a construction site on a hot day. They noticed something. Was it a large pipe? Well, this time it was a snake. They pulled out the longest python ever captured. It took more than five men to carry it out of the construction site without harming it or themselves. The beast was 26 feet long and weighed around 550 pounds. That's only a bit shorter than a light post. The previous record for the longest snake in captivity was the famous Medusa, also a python. That kind of snake can eat its whole weight for lunch. That's like me eating 280 burgers. I definitely don't want fries with that. Back to the water. Behold, the heaviest blue catfish ever caught. The Andersons bagged this guy in Virginia back in 2011, and they've been bragging about it ever since. Weighing in at a whopping 143 pounds, that's like fishing a washing machine out of the lake while standing on a small boat. That's why it took both father and son to drag it on deck. Honorable mention goes to the largest living cat in the world. No, it's not a lion or a tiger, but a little bit of both. It's a liger. Ligers don't exist out in nature, since lions and tigers live in totally different parts of the world. Than wildlife parks, it's been done. Hercules holds this particular record. At over 900 pounds, he's the biggest carnivore mammal in the whole world. He's got his length from his mom, a tiger, and his weight from his dad, a lion called Arthur. Want to know what it's called when the mom is a lion and the dad's a tiger? A tigan. They're way less common than ligers, but they're just as bizarre. That sort of sounds like the ancient Greek mythical creature, the chimera. It was part lion, part goat, part snake, and some stories say it even had bat wings. Oh, and it breathed fire, too. You'd need to bring in a whole bunch of Spartan firefighters to take care of that thing. But it probably hosts a sweet barbecue party. So what about us humans? The award goes to Robert Wadlow from Illinois. He was a staggering 8 foot 11 inches, and he could pick up his dad when he was just 9 years old. Just let that sink in for a while. He ate over 8,000 calories a day, and his shoe size was 37 AA. In 2018, the most powerful underwater earthquake occurred between East Africa and Madagascar. There was a deep rift between the Earth's crust and the mantle. Hundreds of thousands of tons of magma came out on the surface of the ocean floor. After that, a huge underwater volcano with a height of 2,700 feet was formed near the coast of Madagascar. This is almost twice the height of the Empire State Building. And all this is hidden under the water. French scientists studied this place since it had regular seismic activity. When the geologists went on an expedition to the coast of Madagascar, they discovered this giant underwater rock, which was not here until recently. With the help of geological equipment, they discovered the earthquake happened deeper than usual, below the Earth's crust. 
geologists created a special observatory to monitor the situation at this site in real time. Between February and May 2019, they recorded about 17,000 seismic activities below the ocean floor. Scientists had never recorded such deep earthquakes. This suggests that there are reservoirs and drainage systems inside our planet through which magma flows. It's like the veins and vessels of a living organism. The volume of lava the volcano spews at this place can be compared with the volcanic eruptions in the hottest spots of Earth. Perhaps this is one of the most catastrophic, but at the same time, beautiful events in nature over the past few years. To understand what can be beautiful about this, let's first figure out what an underwater volcano is and how it works. Inside our planet, there are incandescent liquid metals and molten rocks containing almost all the chemical elements from the periodic table. All this hot substance is called magma, which constantly flows in the planet's bowels. Anyway, magma is lighter than the surrounding Earth's crust, so it always tries to break out upwards. Fortunately, the surface of our planet is strong enough and doesn't allow magma to splash out. But sometimes it happens, and here's why. The Earth's crust consists of many solid parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other because of movement. Imagine a massive picture of puzzles. Each detail of this puzzle is a tectonic plate, and they all are constantly moving. Sometimes one puzzle gets unhooked from another. When this happens, magma immediately spills out of the resulting gap. And these places of fault with flowing magma we call volcanoes. When such a volcano erupts, a new geology begins. A splash of magma shakes the ocean floor. Lava and ash erupt from the inside of our planet. It causes a release of destructive energy of incredible power. But thanks to the water, such a catastrophe can go unnoticed. More than 70% of the seismic activity associated with volcanoes occurs underwater, and almost no one notices it. But inside the water, there's a total mess. Lava heats the water and destroys the seabed. The ocean in this area boils, and large air bubbles rise up. But the enormous pressure of hundreds of millions of gallons of water suppresses the volcano's destructive power. Molten rocks of the Earth's crust are pressed against the seabed. The ocean blocks the consequences of the disaster. But sometimes, the eruption gets to the surface. Such a case occurred in 2012. Vast pieces of pumice the size of a van began to float up in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. There were hundreds, even thousands of them. It was more like a group of unknown islands. Volcanic rocks scattered in the ocean over an area twice as large as New Zealand. Scientists used deep-sea sonar apparatus on the remote control to determine the full scale of the disaster. They studied the seabed for a long time and found 14 craters that released lava. The researchers saw that more than a third of the erupted volcanic material surfaced and scattered throughout the ocean. The rest was scattered along the bottom. It destroyed all marine life in the area. However, after the eruption of volcanoes, life is reborn like a phoenix from the ashes. Volcanic ash, lava, and soil around the volcano contain many useful elements and minerals. They nourish the soil and promote the development of microorganisms not only on land but also in water. That's why there's so much vegetation, flowers, and trees around volcanoes. And underwater volcanoes can eventually form natural islands. This is a long process, resulting from which a large piece of land comes out of the water. When magma goes out, the water immediately presses it to the seabed. The eruption can go on for a long time. The released magma raises the level of the seabed. After another hundred, maybe a thousand years, a new eruption begins. New magma flows lay a new layer on the surface of the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, the volcano has been growing. It's slowly rising up because of constant eruptions. Some volcanoes may go out forever, and some continue to erupt. And then, one day, the level of volcanic rock reaches the surface in the form of a huge island. After many more years, the volcano may go out, and then life appears on the formed island. 
the destroyed seabed area is filled with animals, trees, flowers, and plants. These volcanic islands have unique ecosystems because they develop separately from all continents. Observing such islands helps scientists understand how life on Earth was born. There are hundreds of islands around the world that have appeared because of eruptions of underwater volcanoes. You can find them in Hawaii, Indonesia, and Iceland. Many of them are inhabited by people. They build villages and small towns there. The ground on such islands is fertile. Fruits and vegetables grow there. The water is filled with fish. Such places may seem like paradise, but at the same time, it's dangerous to live there because the volcano may wake up. One of the most famous eruptions occurred on the island of Ogashima, south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful city right in the crater of an active volcano. And in May 1785, the eruption began. No one expected this to happen. At some point, thousands of birds rose and flew away from the island. And then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from beneath the underground depths. Thick smoke escaped from the top of the green volcano. The mountain threw dirt, large rocks, and red-hot pieces of magma into the sky. The disaster lasted several weeks. People managed to evacuate. And then there was a long recovery. Locals rebuilt the houses and brought the city back. Almost 250 years have passed since that moment. And during this time, the volcano has never woken up. Despite the risk of a new eruption, people continue to live there. The population is growing since this place resembles paradise, and no one wants to leave it. There are thermal springs, dense jungles with rich soil, and many fish. Meteorological and seismological services constantly monitor the volcano's activity. Movements and fractures of tectonic plates create another natural disaster – destructive tsunamis. Unlike volcanoes, huge waves are formed when seismic activity causes the crust to move vertically, up or down. When this happens, water pressure shifts on the ocean floor, which releases energy. This energy pushes the water and creates a tsunami. By the same principle, you form a small wave when you throw a stone into the water. First, a small tsunami appears. Then it picks up speed and increases in size. Its height can reach the level of a five-story building. It's heading for the coast and accelerating to 500 miles per hour. This is almost twice as fast as a Formula One race car. Millions of gallons of water, weighing thousands of tons, are getting closer. And now, the wave reaches the shore and demolishes everything in its path. Houses, trees, cars, nothing can withstand the destructive force of nature. Such tsunamis are a frequent occurrence on the coast of Japan. People have built massive shields near the land to stop the waves before they hit the shore. Still, in spite of all preparedness, somehow, nature always prevails. Can you guess what the largest civilization on Earth is? You're probably thinking about the country with the most people. Well, the largest civilization or group of living beings on the planet is not human at all. And no, I'm not referring to some bacteria you need a microscope to see. You're more familiar with these insects. We've all seen ants. Maybe some of them walked over you during a camping trip. Maybe they got into your clothes. Not a pleasant feeling, right? But these critters are not as primitive as you think. They've built up an entire empire similar to human societies. The total number of ant species is more than 12,000. If they had a country, its flag would probably be black, brown, and red. Those are the most common colors of ants. The size of this ant land would dwarf human countries. These insects live in almost every corner of the planet. Iceland, Antarctica, Greenland, and some smaller islands are the only places they haven't reached. That's because they aren't used to temperatures lower than 52 degrees Fahrenheit. But they have a trick up their sleeve – a really tiny sleeve. <laughs> Ants can slow their metabolism in cold climates. They can live for 3 to 5 days in temperatures close to the ones in your refrigerator. Humans also feel cold in sub-zero conditions, but luckily, we have clothes to keep us warm. It's nearly impossible to count all the individual ants on Earth. 
biologists estimate that there are at least 20 quadrillion of them. You'd probably run out of paper if you tried to write this number down, so let me scale that for you. For every human on the planet, there are around 2.5 million ants. But what we lack in numbers, we make up for in weight. We outweigh ants 193 to 1. Still, their total weight is about 7 times as heavy as the Empire State Building. And ants are much older than humans. Back in 1967, scientists discovered a fossil of an ant species in amber. Yeah, something like that mosquito from the Jurassic Park movie. Researchers dated the find to the Cretaceous period. This was the time when dinosaurs roamed Antarctica. Back then, the region was covered by forests, not ice and snow like today. The ants we have today are descended from an ancient wasp species. This is odd because wasps are solitary creatures. On the other hand, ants are social creatures that live in colonies. Their society has various roles, similar to a human one. The leader of the colony is the queen. There's usually one, but some species have several. The queen is larger than other ants, and it has wings. It also lives longer than other members of the colony, up to 30 years. Compare that to worker ants that can live 7 to 8 years. The queen's role is to lead the ant society and lay eggs. In fire ants, it can lay up to 800 eggs per day. Wow! She does this with the help of male ants called drones. They literally have one job, mate with the queen. You've probably never seen them before because they rarely leave the nest. Hey, they're busy. They live for around one week. The best way to recognize them is by their wings. The queen has wings too, but drones are smaller in size. An ant society can have up to half a million members. Which percentage of these are the queen and her drones? Not much, just several hundred. The biggest population is the workers. They're all female, and they have a variety of tasks. Workers take care of the larvae, find food, and last but not least, protect the colony. When it comes to size, they're somewhat between the queen and the males. Workers never have wings, and they don't lay eggs, but they are great when it comes to defending the home territory. Their array of defenses is impressive. Ants can sting the intruder and even call for backup. The sheer number of ant defenders allows them to successfully tackle intruders 50 times their size. They can stop other insects, mammals, and even vines that come too close to their home base. But most ant species aren't a real danger to humans, although you're going to feel their pinch. Ants release a chemical called formic acid. We use it to produce livestock feed. Some people are allergic to formic acid, so think twice before going head-to-head with an ant. Researchers have discovered a fungus that takes over ants to help itself reproduce. It lives in tropical forests, and it can infect a foraging ant with spores. This isn't an easy task. The spores have to go through the animal's exoskeleton. That's something like our skin. It's waterproof and hard. Because of it, ants can lift objects 10 times their weight. Now, once the spores breach it, the ant's behavior starts to change. It leaves its nest and heads towards a more humid microclimate. Why? because those are the favorable conditions for the fungi's growth. The ant sinks its teeth into a vein of a leaf and waits for its ultimate end. After a couple of days, fungi grow out of the ant's body. Now it's ready to infect the next unsuspecting ant with its poisonous spores. Seems like something you watched on the TV show The Last of Us. But scientists aren't worried. The fungus would need a lot of evolution before it could infect humans. Have you ever wondered how ants communicate? Texting? (laughs) Well, almost. They communicate through the antenna on their heads. Ants pick up scents in the air through them. They also tap the ground and touch pieces of food. And most importantly, they touch each other using these antennae. This helps them identify the ant next to them and relay information. If the nest is in danger, the news has to travel fast to the defenders. Ants' other senses aren't that sharp. They don't have ears at all. These tiny insects sense vibration through the ground. And their eyesight isn't the best either. They are nearsighted. Ants can see up to 3 feet in front of them. Any objects further than that appear blurred to them. Species that live underground don't see at all. 
That's why the antenna are so important for these critters. Ants are pretty good farmers. Leafcutter ones do exactly what their name suggests. They bring the leaves back to the colony. Their fungi grow on them, the good kind. They serve as food for the larva. Nearly 80 ant species have mastered this primitive form of farming. It might look basic to us, but not many animals farm food. Gophers, beetles, and termites are the only other species that do it. And no, ants are not termites. A carpenter ant might look like a termite, but they are different species. Biologists consider several dozen ant species advanced farmers. Their crop is mushrooms, whole gardens of them. They've even cultivated special mushroom varieties. These were domesticated by generations of ants. If you took the mushrooms outside of the ant garden, they wouldn't be able to survive in the wild. But that's not all ants grow. They've also mastered husbandry. Humans have livestock, and ants keep aphids. These are small green bugs that take nutrients from plants and produce nectar called honeydew. It serves as a high-energy food for the ants. They protect aphids from predators, and that's not all. They even milk them. An ant will tickle the bug's abdomen with its antenna. The little fella then willingly releases excess nectar for the ant to feed on. Nature can sometimes be really adorable. There is even a stranger natural phenomenon in the ant world. Ant species from the Americas have been known to go in circles. They do so without stopping until they drop down out of exhaustion. Since they can't see, they follow the femorones of the leading ant. And if it gets off track, the ants following it become trapped in an endless spiral. Humans call these traffic jams. That award for the smallest heart in the world goes to a fairy fly. It's a little insect that's about as thick as a piece of paper. You'll need a microscope to see its heart. Despite the name, this creature isn't a fly. The fairy fly is actually a wasp. If you ever get a chance to look at one under a microscope, you'll see the resemblance. Moving over to bigger but equally impressive hearts from the animal kingdom. Zebrafish have a very cool ability when it comes to their tickers, which are only about 0.04 inches in diameter. Their hearts can regenerate. If a zebrafish's heart ever gets damaged or has a problem, most of the time it can repair itself. Human hearts may be awesome since they continuously try to replace their cells and repair heart tissue, but it's no match for that of the zebrafish. Let's look at cockroaches. Our hearts have four chambers, each of them with a designated task. The system can't function without all four working properly. The heart of a cockroach has 12 to 13 chambers, which are placed in a row along the length of the insect's body, on average about 1.5 inches. They work separately since they're powered by different muscles. This means that if any of those chambers gets affected, the insect might not even notice. Most of the time, the cockroaches survive without all those heart chambers working properly. A hummingbird's heart can beat up to 1,200 times per minute. The heart of a human athlete might only go as fast as 220 beats per minute. Despite being one of the smallest hearts in the world, that of a hummingbird is quite large compared to the bird's full size. It amounts to about 2.5% of its total body weight. By the way, the blue-throated hummingbird flaps its wings up to 15 times each second. It's so fast that this movement cannot be perceived by the human eye. That impressive speed is backed up by an even faster heart, which beats up to 21 times each second. Ever heard of the emperor penguin? It's not a penguin species that just happens to have a crown on its head, if that's what you're thinking. They are fascinating swimmers that can dive deeper than any other bird, up to 700 feet. Not to mention that they can stay submerged for up to 18 minutes at a time as they gather food. Their hearts are equally as spectacular, weighing somewhere around 5 ounces. Their hearts are very slow. When in the water, an emperor penguin can reduce its heart rate to about 15 beats per minute. 
it shuts down the blood supply to all but the most vital organs. It also dials down oxygen consumption, allowing the animal to use only what's necessary for deep water hunting. Heart size tends to be pretty proportional throughout the animal kingdom. Most of these organs weigh somewhere around 0.6% of an animal's body mass. Dogs and wolves have bigger hearts by comparison, about 0.8% of the animal's total weight. An average dog's heart weighs about 20 ounces. If a human heart suddenly got filled with fat, it would become a problem pretty fast. But that's very different for a python, though. If that happens to this reptile, it's actually a sign that things are going great. Pythons tend to have really big meals. After each of such meals, their hearts get larger by about 40%. And since a python can weigh as much as 250 pounds, that's a lot. Most of these increases is caused by the snake's heart swelling up because of fatty acids absorbed from the meal. These reptiles adapted to do so to speed up their digestion, even though it still takes them days to process one single meal. Their blood gets so full of fatty acids, it even changes its color and consistency. In some cases, it may even turn opaque, looking more like milk than anything else. Finishing our chart on the other side of the spectrum, the largest heart in the animal kingdom belongs to the blue whale. And for a good reason, since they're some of the largest animals ever. This giant heart is about as big as a bathtub and weighs more than the average gorilla. Regardless of their size, animal hearts are amazing. Us humans and most animals just have one heart, but this rule doesn't apply to all creatures. Take octopuses or squids, which have three hearts. This is how their system works. Two of their hearts help to pump blood to the gills, so they have enough oxygen in their bodies. The third heart pumps blood around the body. Some animals don't have hearts altogether. It doesn't necessarily make them mean, though. Jellyfish, starfish, or corals lead pretty good lives even without hearts. Take starfish, for example. They don't even have blood. That's probably the reason why they don't need a heart either. No list is complete without some amazing facts about the human heart. You don't need to Google it or look for an anatomy book to know how big your heart is. Just squeeze your fingers and make a fist. That's about as large as the heart gets in adults. This amazing organ is responsible for keeping everything active in our bodies. It can beat about 115,000 times every day. Ever watched a cartoon in which the main character's heart just starts pumping out of its chest? Most of the time, we're tricked into thinking that the sound our heart makes is produced when this organ touches the tissue surrounding it when beating. Turns out that this sound is actually made by the opening and closing of the heart valves. They're like small doors inside our hearts that ensure that blood flows correctly from one side of the heart to the other. For our bodies to work, blood needs to move at the right time and in the right direction. Our lungs are not twins, they're siblings, and our heart is the reason. Our right lung is bigger and tends to weigh more, and our heart is to blame. Our ticker tilts to the left a bit. This creates a small indentation in our left lung, which is called the cardiac impression. The right lung may be bigger, but it's a bit shorter since it needs to make room for the liver. Speaking of positioning, our heart is really not as far on the left as we might think. It's actually pretty centered with just a slight tilt to the left. People born with dextrocardia, though, have their hearts positioned on the right side of their chest. This condition, on its own, isn't problematic, but it tends to coincide with other diseases that can have serious effects on the heart and other organs. Do you know most heart attacks happen on Mondays? The reason is still up for debate, but most scientists believe it has to do with the stress of starting a new working week or with the changes in our sleep-wake cycle. 
You tend to sleep more at the weekend, and waking up earlier on Monday may be detrimental to your heart. Your heart started beating about four weeks after you were conceived, and it won't stop until you pass away. Sure, it may get weaker as you grow older, but the heart doesn't get tired. It's a really hard job if you think about it. Try this experiment to test it out. Squeeze a tennis ball in your hand. Your beating heart is about the same force, 100,000 times a day. I bet you'll lose count before finishing. In some cases, the energy our hearts need to carry on pumping is unstable. That's why pacemakers were invented. They act like small generators placed inside the human body. They help with stabilizing abnormal heart rhythms. The first ever device of this kind was put into a woman's body back in 1958. Her name was Arna Larson, and when she passed away at 86, it was because of other issues. It had nothing to do with her heart. The Amazon River, the boat, and dense jungle on both sides. All is silent. Only the engine is revving, and you look around nervously under the earnest gaze of the Peruvian guy. Suddenly, the man smiles and points ahead. This is it. You've finally arrived at Iquitos. The city is hidden deep within the Amazon rainforest. On one side, Iquitos is surrounded by water, and on the other lies thick, impenetrable rainforest as far as the eye can see, making this city extremely difficult to reach. First, you had to fly to Peru's capital, Lima, a vibrant coastal city. From there, you traveled by bus through Peru's vast jagged mountains before being plunged into the heart of the Amazon rainforest. Three days into this bus journey, you reached a small town where the road suddenly stopped. At over 140 square miles, Iquitos is the largest continental city in the world that cannot be reached by road. You're still over 200 miles away from Iquitos, so from here, you take a boat ride along the hot, humid Amazon River before finally reaching the remote city five days after you left Lima. When you arrive in the city, you notice many of the houses are built on tall stilts. This is because, in the springtime, the river surrounding Iquitos swells up, submerging parts of the city in water. For this, Iquitos has been nicknamed the Venice of the Amazon. The stilted houses are tall enough to avoid the murky waters of the Amazon River. You hear loud buzzing coming from all around the city. It sounds like a gang of bikers have arrived. In reality, these are motocarios. There are very few cars in Iquitos. Instead, they have motorcycles with small passenger cabins attached to them. There are around 45,000 of these things whizzing around Iquitos, making the city very noisy. Your trip to the most isolated places has just begun. So, you head to Norway and arrive in the capital city, Oslo. Immediately, you hop on another plane. After a three-hour flight, you land at the world's northernmost public airport, Longyi Arbyen. You step off the plane to see a small and colorful town enclosed by snow-topped mountains. There's no settlement further to the north than this. Long Yarbian translates to the Long Year Town, named after its American founder, coal miner John Long Year. You take a walk along the coast of the small town. The water is a beautiful crystal blue. You decide to dip your toe in to test it out. Ow! Bad idea! The average temperature of the water here is 32 degrees, making it ice cold. In the distance, you can make out a fuzzy white creature. It's a polar bear. In fact, it's a group of them. In Long Yerbian, polar bears famously outnumber humans. Around 3,000 of these animals populate the area compared to the human population of 2,300. Finally, the sun sets. You grab a blanket and sit back to take in the stunning view of the northern lights. Now, imagine you're walking in the scorching heat across Egypt's Great Sand Sea. You've been walking for miles, hours, days even, dreaming of water, greenery, and a place to rest, when suddenly you come across a small settlement with olive groves, palm trees, and even freshwater springs. This isn't a heat-induced mirage. It's the Siwa Oasis, an Egyptian city of 23,000 people and a miracle of nature. You travel here by flying to Egypt's capital, Cairo, and then embarking on a lengthy and desolate bus ride across the desert. When you finally spot some greenery amongst the sand, you have reached the Siwa Oasis. After refreshing yourself in the cool waters of the springs, you explore the city further and come across ancient ruins. 
This city has existed since 10,000 BCE, and many historical remnants can still be found there today. Amongst these ruins, you notice there are newer buildings. These are where the modern-day Siwi people live. You spend some time with the Siwi, a friendly and unique community of Egyptians. They tell you all about their city. The Siwa Oasis is located in the middle of the Sahara Desert, and due to its harsh climate, it's one of the most remote cities in the world. You notice how dry the air is and how scorching the sun feels. Reaching highs of 118 degrees Fahrenheit, this heat makes the Siwa Oasis a difficult place to live. It's time to travel to a more balanced climate. You head northeast and arrive in Russia's capital, Moscow. From there, you take a flight east again, traveling further and further across Russia until you're closer to Alaska than to Moscow. You've reached the city of Petropavlovsk, which translates to City of Peter and Paul. The first thing you see are giant mountains surrounding the city, cutting it off from the rest of the world. These mountains are in fact volcanoes. In this far eastern part of Russia, there are more than 300 volcanoes, including 29 active ones. These volcanoes stop any roads from reaching Petropavlovsk. The city depends on flights and boats to import supplies. You turn away from the volcanoes to stare out at the blue, shimmering ocean. The water looks nice, so you head down to the beach where a crowd of sea lions are sunbathing along the sand. Petropavlovsk is home to incredibly diverse wildlife. Just off the shore, you can see a whale fin poking out of the water. You explore the city's diverse landscape. You go to one of the city's ski resorts and spend the day on the slopes. Then you hike up a rocky path to the base of one of the city's many volcanoes. Finally, it's time to relax on a boat tour around the island to see the city's famous Three Brothers rock formation. Feeling inspired, you travel to another volcanic land, Chile's Easter Island. The island doesn't have a harbor, and only one airline flies to the remote land. So you travel an entire day to Santiago, Chile. Then you climb aboard a small plane to fly to Easter Island. You walk among the high cliffs of the barren island and come across its famous monuments. These are giant, mysterious statues of human heads. They're called moai and were carved by the local people around 800 years ago. You inspect the earth beneath your feet. It looks and feels very dry. Easter Island consists of three ancient volcanoes. The volcanic soil makes it very difficult to grow crops or vegetation. Some of the city's trees were cleared hundreds of years ago to make way for the stone monuments, giving the island the empty look it has today. You embark on a boat ride 1,100 miles west from Easter Island. You reach a small green land floating in the Pacific Ocean. This is Pitcairn Island. You might recall that this place played a major role in the mutiny on the bounty. You come down from the boat and begin your journey to reach Adamstown, the center of the island where its 43 inhabitants live. To reach Adamstown, you hike the Hill of Difficulty, a steep and rocky 200-foot climb to the top of the island. Now that you've finally made it here, you can explore the diverse and unique nature of the land. Pitcairn Island is home to the largest marine reserve in the world. You take a snorkeling trip and swim alongside all kinds of exotic fish. You explore vibrant coral reefs and even catch sight of a rare humpback whale. Dreaming of the great days of the old Wild West, you decide to travel to Supai, Arizona. To get to this Native American settlement and fragment of the past, you drive along America's famous Route 66. You stop, seemingly in the middle of nowhere with only desert land as far as the eye can see. Then you follow an 8-mile walking trail to reach Supai. You hike down into the Grand Canyon, almost 3,000 feet deep. You come across a stunning waterfall spilling over the cliffs of the canyon. This is Havasu Falls, a popular tourist spot famous for its vivid blue-green water. After a further miles hike, you finally reach Supai. Over 200 members of the Havasupai Indian tribe reside in the small town. It's often referred to as the most remote town in the United States. To your left, you see several mules making their way across town with packages on their backs. Because no roads lead to this small settlement, mail is delivered by a mule train. Without it, it would take the average mail carrier a 16-hour hike to complete this route. You walk around the area and come across many more towering blue waterfalls. The untouched nature and great views of the Grand Canyon make the long hike worthwhile. After a beautiful sunset, nighttime falls, and there are no lights for miles. The land is lit up by the countless stars shining overhead.